Hello and welcome back to the Alchemical Arts. Hope everybody is well today and is ready to get stuck into some pigment making. Today we're going to be hitting another one of the classic lake pigments and we're going to be looking at Dutch Pink, which is a yellow lake from Buckthorn Berries. Now it's interesting that it's called Dutch Pink. It's also called Still de Grain, I think is another name for it. And basically it's just a yellow lake that's derived from often buckthorn berries, but sometimes you could use a particular type of oak bark as well as turmeric and saffron and things like that. It's sometimes it was a blend of like buckthorn, oak bark and turmeric all together. But today we're going to focus in on just doing a buckthorn yellow lake. Um, and the reason it's called Dutch pink isn't really well known. There's a few theories out there. Some at some point in time, there was the English word for pink meant yellow. Um, there were other ways you could say pink or use the word pink to mean what we now consider pink. But at some point in 16th, 17th century, there was an English use of the word pink that referred to yellow, which is kind of confusing, but that's just the way it is. So Dutch pink is an interesting pigment in the sense that, well, firstly, it's not particularly light fast. It was used for a lot of different applications, uh, some distemper, wall mural painting, as well as oil painting, and it tends to fade fairly quickly in sunlight. However, there are some things you can do to mitigate some of that. And when it's used in oil painting, um, and obviously if the paintings are kept out of sunlight, it should be okay. Some of the best examples we have of use of Dutch pink is by the Dutch masters, Rembrandt, Rubens, Vermeer. They all really liked this pigment because, and we'll get to this later, or uh, we'll, we'll show examples of this later, it's a, it makes this really beautiful golden translucent glazing paint. So when you mix up the pigment in an oil, it makes a very, very translucent glassy kind of golden color so you can really use it so if you so we're going to show some examples of Vermeer and Rembrandt's use but like if you put down like a a lead tin yellow and then glaze it with the Dutch pink you get this really luminous vibrance um, happening with it and you know for Rembrandt you know he's got those oily golden brown backgrounds and stuff like that so you, you can imagine like glazing this like golden resinous oil paint over the top with like the translucency really gives it those glow effects and those sort of really warm golden tones that we associate with the Dutch masters like Rubens and Rembrandt and Vermeer and stuff like that. So it's a really beautiful thing. It's a shame that it doesn't have the permanence that it should or not should have. It's a shame it doesn't have the per permanence that we would like it to have because it's really beautiful. I think I've read that if you make the pigment and instead of using a tradition, traditional alum to do the precipitate, so using you know potassium aluminium sulfate, you use something like a lead salt, so you end up precipitating onto a lead oxide, um, you get a bit more of a permanent uh, pigment, but it loses some of its translucency and becomes a little bit more opaque. Um, I think that's something I'll explore in the future. Um, testing out a lead-based lake pigment. But for now, we'll stick to a, a simple alum pigment so that we can really highlight that translucency and, and play around. So I'm going to make it up into some oil paint later, and I'm going to prepare some, some fairly heavy impasto paintings, and we're going to, like, glaze over the top of those to really highlight its glazing potentials um, as a pigment. But otherwise we'll get stuck into a fairly straightforward lake making process with this, but we're going to try out some differences where we're going to precipitate the pigment at different temperatures to see what effect that has on the overall color. So let's get stuck into making our pigment and so that we can get straight to the painting stage of this one because I think the painting stage of this episode is really one I want to highlight as we've been through so many lake making stuff in the last 
X number of videos on this channel that you're really getting an idea of how you make lake pigment. But looking at what you can do with lake pigments is really interesting as well. And I haven't done enough painting on this channel. Um, there's been so much focus on pigment making and not much in pigment application. So let's get, get cracking on that now. First thing we want to do is take a little bit of our buckthorn and we're going to place it into our mortar and pestle here. We just have a really simple um, porcelain mortar and pestle and we're just going to give this a bit of a grind. So just take a good handful of your buckthorn berries, add them into your mortar and pestle and then once you've got that in there, we're going to do a little bit of a tapping motion to break everything down first and then we're just going to keep doing our grinding as we normally grind up our things in the mortar and pestle. Once we reach about this point where, you know, not everything is in a perfectly fine powder, but it's pretty ground up. It's like a coarse meal kind of thing. I reckon this is good and we're ready to move on to the extraction of the color process, which will be just a simple water, hot water extraction. So yeah, I'm just going to place this in my beaker and we're going to get started doing an extraction. So now that we've ground our buckthorn, we're going to add it to our beaker here. I did weigh this buckthorn out and I have about 15 grams here of ground up buckthorn. And to this we're going to add our hot water in the kettle here. And we're going to add about, probably just about, just under 400 mils there. And then what we're going to do is we're going to turn our stirring on. We're going to get the heat going on the hot plate here. And we're going to boil this for about an hour or so. And then after that, we'll filter out the buckthorn and we'll go through adding the alum. So we'll come back in an hour and see what this looks like. Oh, stir bar has got away from us. Stop doing that. There we go. That's better. All right, we'll check back in in an hour. So here we are after about an hour of heating and stirring. And as you can see, we've kind of developed this kind of interesting mustard yellow kind of color. Um, if we to stop the stirring, and we'll turn off the heat and we'll let things start to settle out. You can see that we've extracted quite a nice sort of color. It's really interesting, um, the actual plant material itself is this kind of pale mustard yellow and the liquid that we have in there is this kind of golden amber which is kind of hard to see at the moment but as it separates out you should be able to see some of that although because the hot plate is hot it's still boiling and it will churn around but you can see in there there's this sort of golden amber colored liquid that has been formed um, but yeah it's really beautiful so what we're going to do now is I'm just going to take this and run it through the vacuum filter to take all of the plant material out and we'll be left with just our extracted color liquid and from there we're going to work on doing our alum and then our precipitation. So I've gone and made a second buckthorn extraction exactly the same as the first and filtered both of them so that we've filtered all the plant material up and we just have our extracted color liquid. So both used 15 grams of buckthorn berries and what I'm doing here, which we'll get in closer when we actually do the precipitation, but I'm heating one of the solutions up to near boiling temperature. So it's currently at about 80 degrees and I'm keeping the other one at room temperature. Now to both of them, I have added, I have made up an alum solution of three grams of alum. And I've just added that in to our buckthorn solution and we're going to go through and add our chalk and do our precipitation. So what I'm trying to do here is to see if there is a color shift difference between 
doing the precipitation with chalk at a high temperature, like 80, 90 degrees near boiling, and at room temperature, and see if we get a difference in color result or whether it's really an unnecessary step to go through. And if we do get a difference, what is the difference and what do you prefer? Maybe you could find a temperature in between or you could just work with one extreme or the other. So let's get in close and let's start by doing the precipitation of the hot liquid here. Uh, and then we'll do the precipitation of the cold. So in this ramekin here, we have ourselves a, about 10 grams of chalk, which is just calcium carbonate. We've brought our liquid up to about 85 degrees Celsius. So we, what we're going to do is now just slowly spoon the chalk in and we'll start precipitating our pigment. We should get some bubbling reaction, some yellowness, and I think I might increase the stirring here. As we do this, look at that. We're already getting this sort of yellow boiling froth happening. Here's a view down into there, as you can see. There's a golden yellow froth forming. Okay, we're gonna take the thermometer out now as we add the rest of our chalk. Oh, there we go. Let's get all of that chalk in there. Look at that color, that's really nice. It's super bright, rich. I'm gonna turn the heating off at this stage, but we'll keep the stirring going because we wanna make sure all of that chalk dissolves nicely. And get all this froth worked down. I'm going to stop the stirring here. I'm going to take this off the hot plate. I'm going to set it to the side, let the pigment settle out, and then we're going to go through a filtration process and collect our pigment. And I'm also going to wait for the hot plate to cool down so that I can get the cold solution onto the stir. And then we'll add the chalk to that and we'll see how that pans out. Okay, now we have the cold mixture here and we're gonna do exactly the same thing. We're gonna add 10 grams of chalk to this while it's stirring. And let's see how we go here. The reaction probably won't happen as quickly due to the fact that it's cold. Let's ramp up this stirring a little bit. go, we have the 10 grams of chalk added, and we get the stirring really happening. This is a bit more of a paler mustard kind of color, as opposed to the color here, which is a little bit more golden, but it's hard to tell, and it's probably going to end up being fairly similar. We'll just have to wait until we collect all of our pigment to see what we get. 
But I'm just going to give this a stir for a few minutes. As you can see, there was no frothing this time that we did this. It's probably because of the cold temperature. But I'm going to stir this for a couple of minutes. And then after that, I'm going to go through and filter both of them and collect the pigments, dry them, and we'll have a look. So here we have the two pigment samples wet, just coming off from being filtered. This is the one that we did at heat at about 85 degrees, and this is the one we did that is cold. You can kind of see that this one looks a little bit darker overall, whereas the one that we did cold seems to be a little bit brighter and a bit more yellow. If we have a look underneath there, you can see this sort of paler, brighter, sort of more vibrant color. And then if we look over here, we have this sort of more browny, sort of raw sienna sort of look, whereas this is more of a yellow ochre. It'll be interesting to see what happens when we dry these and take stock of the color then. So I'm just gonna get these drying and then we'll have a look from there. So I've dried and ground both of the lakes that we've made here. And as you can see, the final difference is quite subtle. So the darker one here was the one that we produced at the higher temperatures. And the slightly lighter one here is the one that we produced cold. So really the difference is quite subtle. This one's a little bit cleaner, a little bit more golden. This one's a little bit earthier and a little bit darker. But all in all, pretty similar results. Obviously we're working with the same materials so the tones are gonna to be obviously similar and I think the difference between the temperature precipitation is probably about the particle sizes that were produced at those different temperatures. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to grind um, this up, both of these up in some oil paint and once we have an oil paint of these we're going to put them into a glaze medium, which I have a really fantastic glaze medium that I've been wanting to try out for a really long time. And I've done a little bit of a painting in acrylic with a, I have an acrylic cadmium and some white and some black, and I've done like an impasto acrylic, and we're gonna glaze over the top of that and have a look at the glazing qualities. So yeah, let's make this up into some oil paint and go for a little bit of a, a glaze. Making up an oil paint. Let's start with the lighter colored one and we'll just pop a bit onto our grinding plate here. I'm not really worried about how much I'm making here. It's just a rough little batch. So let's do about that much and let's get ourselves This linseed oil. We're going to get ourselves just a little bit of linseed oil and it's important when making oil paints that you use the minimal amount of oil that you can possibly get away with using. You don't want to use too much oil otherwise you end up with separation issues and it's... Making oil paints is an interesting process something we haven't explored on the channel here yet um, because it's quite an in-depth conversation so this may look like it's very dry to begin with and it will need a tiny bit more linseed oil but I really don't want to overdo it it's interesting how it turns to this like extremely brown paste quite quickly um, as it gets saturated you've got this like really goldeny pigment and then this sort of brown paste there that's probably just on the brink of slightly too much oil yep you see there immediately turned from being too stiff to way too liquid so we're going to add a little bit more pigment I'm going to try and work this back into a stiffer paste. 
Yeah, that's that's getting closer. So let's scrape this off here. Even that may still be too much oil. Um, but we'll get, get the mauler in there and we'll do a bit of a grind before we assess. Okay. Oh, I love the smell of linseed oil. Now, because the pigment is quite rough, because the grind that I did in that small mortar and pestle there was quite a rough grind. You can see that it's very, very granulated. Very textured. So it's gonna take a little bit of grinding to get it into a smooth, buttery oil paint. But it shouldn't be too bad. Obviously it's a little bit tricky to see the color because I've got this bit of black um, rubber matting underneath the glass here, just so that it helps the glass not slide around all over the place while I'm grinding. But once we get this, we'll paint a bit out onto some white so that you can see what it looks like on white paper. Making oil paint certainly gives you a good arm workout because it's a lot trickier than watercolor grinding in some respects. This really just looks like a sort of an ochre sienna color. So I went ahead and ground the second one up. I didn't bother filming it because you don't need to see me film a bunch of oil paint grinding for half an hour or more. But so this is the first one. This is the cold one here. And as you can see, it is ever so slightly lighter in color. This one is more of a deeper brown, sort of almost a warm sienna kind of color. And this is like a raw sienna kind of color. Um, both of them really lovely colors um, they appear to be quite translucent they've made a fairly nice oil paint this one could be ground a little further for a little bit longer it's not got that nice sheen it's got a little bit of rippling in there which says there's still some granular bits but honestly this will do for our demonstration purposes so I'm going to take these paints and I'm going to mix them with a glaze medium and we're going to paint them onto a underpainting that I've done as well as we'll paint a little bit of these out onto some white canvas as they are just so that we can see how they look but you know you get get the picture there they're really nice really nice color really happy with the results so we've got our two paints here all made up and I've just got a little piece of paper here um, it's a nice piece of paper but we're just going to brush some out to have a look at the color. So let's start with the colder extraction one, the lighter colored one. And let's just brush out a fairly thick amount on here and then work towards brushing it out thinner. You can see in its thicker form, 
it's this very browny ochre color but then once you start to spread it out you get this really nice sort of golden yellow color um, that is very translucent so I like that a lot I'd be interested to do some actual permanence testing to see what the overall quality of the permanence really is like. Um, I might take these and once they dry we'll do a sunlight test for a couple of months, although it is winter here at the moment so that won't give us a great indication of what we're dealing with. So let's wipe off my brush and let's move on to the other one here get a nice thick layer of that down and start to spread that out too and well as you can see there once you actually spread them out they're almost almost so so close to being identical um, it's really only in the thickness and maybe the slight saturation of this one that was done hot is slightly darker than that one. But once they're spread out, I mean, gee, you can really barely tell the difference. So this is a, a liquid glass medium from Renaissance Materials. And this is something I picked up when I was in London a few years back. And I think this is going to make a wonderful glaze medium that I've been really meaning to try. As you can see, I've not used any of it. But I think it's going to work really well for this. So I'm going to mix both of these up with a little bit of this glaze medium. We're going to take it over to a little painting that I did the other day. It's not a great painting. It's just a rough painting. And I want to see how this pigment performs as a glaze over a various array of black, yellow, and whites to see if we can get that luminous glazing quality that I'm looking for, that, that kind of oily, old master's glow effect. And I think this is going to be the perfect medium. All right, here's the painting that we're going to be glazing. We're going to do this half with the lighter one, and we're going to do this half with the darker one. So. Let's start with the lighter one, and I've mixed it up with the glaze medium, and let's start putting it on. need a better brush than this. Okay, so we got ourselves a bigger, better brush to do the job. Let's really get that on there. There we go. Oh, it's so nice and oily. So I'm just trying to feather it out at the moment. do a bit of wiping back once we're done. We may actually need to mix up more of this because it's so thick. But look at that, look at how it goes into the impasto there and just all of those little details. We'll get in and do some close-ups in a second. up some more of this now. There we 
put it on nice and thick to get really golden resinous sort of look. You can already see how much that's brought it to life and given it this sort of depth of this very, very golden glow. Um, what's on the underpainting here is a cadmium yellow and a white and a black. Um, and we'll do a little bit of whiting back once we're done. But let's get on to the other side with the darker one. Which we're also going to have to make some more of that up, I think. You can see that this is actually drastically darker now that I'm looking at it and actually applying it nice and thickly onto here. And as I said, we're going to do a lot of wiping black with a cloth, but I just really want to get this on here nice and thick. I'm kind of over exaggerating the entire experience to give us that classic old masters look. Let's just have a little close look here. As you can see, this really luminous, bright, but um, ultimately translucent effect across everything. So I'm going to do a bit of wiping back now so that we can have a look at it after we've wiped back the excess of the glaze. So just got a clean rag here. There you have it. You can really see how this glaze gets nicely into everything. And when you have some impasto work, you can get this really beautiful effect. This is really, this really does give me that Rembrandt-y vibe. Like obviously my painting is no Rembrandt, but uh, <laughs> you really get that, that oily resinous goldenness stuff. And I know a lot of the actual deep, resinous, glowy colours of Rembrandt's is because of ageing varnish, but he definitely didn't entirely stray away from this, this golden, the golden glow that we associate. But yeah, it's fun stuff. That um, liquid glass medium is extremely cool stuff. Um, I'll link in the description of this video to Renaissance Materials and the Alchemy of Paint as well, who's the person who makes it over in the UK. But yeah, fun stuff. So that about wraps it up for this episode. Um, I hope you enjoyed watching that process of making the Buckthorn Berry Lake, the Stilder Grain or the Dutch Pink or whatever you want to call it. Um, it's a fascinating pigment. I'll have to do some testing to see how not light fast or light fast it is, um, but from everything I've read they've said it's not particularly light fast, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have its applications. Um, as you can see, I had a really fun time mixing it up in the glaze medium there. Um, there'll be a link in the description to the uh, where I got the glaze medium from, and also if you're in Australia, and looking to get some good quality lake making materials, check out St. Luke's Art because they um, stock some of the best lake making materials and they were kind enough to give me some buckthorn berries to play with, but 
plus a bunch more lake making supplies which I'll get working on some videos for those coming soon so we've got some uh, weld and uh, what else have we got here in the cupboard we got oh, well we had the oak galls from the last episode and I've got some saff flour that I want to work through um, but at the moment I'm actually deep into filming the next course so I've got the uh, I guess I haven't quite decided exactly what I'm calling it but it's either going to be uh, a complete lake making guide uh, course or a natural pigments course because it's going to include some ochre and some inks and some other things like that but yeah so lots of work going on at the moment for figuring out all of the recipes and the bits and pieces that will get people started making their own lake, make, lake pigments um, because you know this channel's been a really good kind of experience for like sharing this but I wanted to put together a very structured course to help people basically learn to make their own pigments and I felt like the world of natural pigments and lakes and ochres and earth pigments was a good place for people to start because some of the more you know complex uh, chemistry that we've done on the channel with our cobalts and our cadmiums and calcinations and working with heavy metals that's not really for people to do at home um, without any sort of experience or practice or good setup for that but natural pigments that's definitely something you can do at home so I'm hoping to have the course out in the next you know, maybe month to two months it's probably gonna be more like two months there's a lot a lot of work going into it if you want to go and check out my previous course on learning how to make watercolors and you want to Get, you know, a really comprehensive guide on making your own watercolors and all the troubleshooting that's associated with making your own watercolor paints, then there'll be a link in the description of this video for that course. Um, but otherwise, stay tuned. There'll be more lake making videos, more pigment videos. I'm Hopefully, once I get this course finished, I can get back to some of the metal-based pigments, things like manganese and more cobalts and... All sorts of interesting stuff like that get the kiln going again let's get some things roasting and firing at extra hot temperatures because that's always fun anyway that's it for today um catch you all soon for the next video